like to welcome you today to today's telecast of True Hope for Today. You know, as we embark upon a uh, new year, 2023 is upon us now, and uh, as we uh, go about uh, beginning this new year, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, something I believe God is uh, doing, not only in the church, but in each and every one of us individually, and that's he's doing a new thing. If you would uh, turn with me to Isaiah 43, 18, and 19, and they read, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You know, many of us here uh, this evening, listening to this telecast, if we're honest with ourselves, we will admit that we have areas of our life where we're dissatisfied and have no joy. And we've made promises that we haven't been able to keep. And we've experienced failure and setbacks. But you know the beauty of Isaiah's words to us is quite simple. It's not over until God says it's over. God is more interested in your future than your past. Can I get an amen on that? Let me share with you uh, the story, the narrative behind our text, and the basis of today's message. In this 43rd uh, chapter, the prophet Isaiah is doing what he does best. Serves as a mouthpiece for the Lord during one of the most trying times in the history of the Israelites. At this time, the Israelites are uh, being held captive in Babylon and are at their lowest point. They're not just discouraged, but uh, fully defeated, deflated, and depressed. I might ask, has anybody been there before? Or is anybody there now? Well, at this low point, God sends a word through the prophet Isaiah. He sends a message because God knew that his people needed some reassurance and went about uh, reassuring them in this 43rd chapter by first telling of who he is. In verse 1, he tells them that he is their creator, the one who made them out of nothing. And then in verse 3, he tells them that he is their Lord, that he is the one who loves them, and that they are precious in his sight. In verse 14, he tells them that uh, he is their Redeemer, and that all they need, he is all they need when in bondage. Then in verse 15, he tells them that he is the Holy One, that he is the one who keeps his promises. You know, if I was facing a major challenge in my life, had some hills to climb, some giants to deal with, some raging rivers to cross, these are things that would, would reassure me. How about you? Well, that wasn't enough. In verse 16 and 17, he reminds them of the great things he had done for their forefathers. He brought them out of bondage in Egypt. Then in the middle of the Red Sea, he made a highway for his people and a graveyard for their enemies. And God is all-powerful. If you're not sure, think about what the Lord has done for us. Some of us uh, face Pharaoh's army uh, in the form of a doctor's diagnosis that death was our destination. 
Some of us faced Pharaoh's army when we lost a job or found ourselves not being able to pay our bills. You know, as a church family, we faced Pharaoh's army when our church building was falling down around us and we were in few numbers. But in every one of those situations, somebody is a witness to the fact that God made a way out of what seemed no way. Can I get a witness? Didn't God do it? When you think about all the Lord has done, when you think about what changes have been made, somebody ought to shout glory. But in verse 18, God says, forget about the past. Forget about the former things. Don't think about it. In other words, God says, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm about to do something brand new. Would that excite you? Would that encourage you? You must truly believe that God is able to see you through. You must not have a I hope so kind of faith, I think so kind of faith, or a I wish kind of think faith. You have to have a I know so kind of faith. You know, faith uh, that will allow you to see your failures and setbacks is a stepping stone. Faith that tells you in your darkest hour that God is bigger than your most powerful enemy. And faith that tells you that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. You know, to experience the new and amazing thing that God has prepared for you, you must act on your faith. And to act, to do the things that the Lord requires of us, we must first change our thinking. You know, Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. You know, some of our thoughts, our thinking patterns only cause us trouble. If we focus on our failures, I can't, I tried that before, but it uh, didn't work. Nobody can. Nothing is going to happen in our lives. Likewise, if we focus on our past successes, look at what I did. Look at how good I was. Look at what I used to have. Nothing new is going to happen in our lives. You know, the fact of the matter is that if you want to repeat history, do what's already been done. But if you want to make history, do what's never been done before. But you don't have to do it alone because my Bible tells me that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. You know, hold that thought as we uh, look at uh, verse 19 of our text where God says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You know, too often we fail because we depend on what we understand, what, what we can do. But Zechariah 4, 6 reminds us that we will succeed not by our own strength or power, but by God's. Then Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 tells us that when faced with a mountain or a valley, to trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. You know, what do you do when you've done all you can, and it seems like it's never enough? 
And what do you say when friends turn away from you and you're all alone? What do you, uh, what do you give when you're given your all and it seems like you can't make it through? When there's nothing left to do, you just stand. Watch the Lord see you through. When you're challenged in life, just remember that the same power that got the children of Israel through the Red Sea is the same power that will make a way for you. So just stand and watch the Lord see you through. If he can make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, we know that he's able to move our present mountains out of our way. You know, the God that we serve is able to do abundantly above. Abundantly above all that we could ever think. If it can cause a virgin to conceive a child, he can see us through. Amen? If a Lord can open the Red Sea, he can open doors of opportunity. When there seems to be no way, the Lord will create a way. Where there seems to be no present hope, the Lord will give us hope. When there seems to be no present joy, in Christ, we will discover new joy. When we seem to have no strength, we'll find that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We serve a God who is going to do a new thing in our lives. The former things were great and mighty, but there's more to come. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, perhaps uh, you are distant from the place that God made for you, not enjoying the blessing of what he intended for your life. Never accept the things that are tormenting in life as though they were predestined for you because they weren't. God's intended place for you, as announced over and over in the Word, is benevolently planned with high promise and purpose. There are circumstances in our lives in which we feel besieged. It's wearying. You live in the insecurity of never knowing when the problem will erupt that will eventuate in the crashing defeat of something you've hoped for. Finances have a way of doing this to us. The uncertainty of being able to make it from here to there. Relationships have the same kind of quality when things become stressed to the break point. You know, sometimes we arrive into uh, circumstances we may not have created or produced them, but nevertheless, we're in the middle of them. Whatever the reason you're in a problematic situation, the Lord says he set himself to do something new anyway. You know, God reminds us of his role in his work. In Isaiah 43, verses 15 through 17, God reminds us of who he is. He says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. You know, God's call for us to prepare for a new thing reminds us that it is he who, in his redemptive grace, 
comes in his holiness to make people whole. He reminds us of the kind of things he can do. As our creator, the source of all being, the best things in you are God's idea. As our king, a proven and benevolent ruler bigger than your circumstance. As our complete deliverer, making a way where there is none, he's the vanquisher of the retaliator against you. You know, sometimes it seems like as soon as God does a good thing, the adversary comes back to get even. Just as Pharaoh uh, pursued Israel after they'd been delivered from Egypt, as Israel approaches the Red Sea and begins to break through to victory, they look back and see Pharaoh's army is coming along behind. The very path of their deliverance has become their enemy's path of pursuit. Now God says, just you wait and see. This is going to be good. The Israelites pass through the Red Sea and the waters closed in on their enemy. God is our complete deliverer. He will not take us halfway there. God no sooner reminds us of the mighty new thing he did at the Red Sea than his next words are, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old in verse 18. He's not saying that uh, they're unimportant, but he's admonishing us to uh, confine, not to confine him to what's already been done. Moses could have never dreamt what was going to happen when he took an obedient stance, holding out the rod and speaking the words the Lord had told him to speak. He was probably just as amazed at what happened as was everybody else. You know, the miracle at the Red Sea uh, was beyond anyone's ability to speculate or guess, and, uh, and there are new things God wants to do for us that are beyond anything we can fathom, invent, ask, or even imagine. Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Perhaps you're facing a situation so overwhelming that unless God does something that transcends human imagination, you don't know of any way that it will work out. Maybe what the Lord's getting ready to change is you rather than the circumstance. Nevertheless, he promises that he's going to do a new thing. You know, why does God uh, project to do a new thing without giving us an indication of what it's going to be or even uh, that it's approaching? First, he withholds telling us in order to keep us from trying to anticipate his ways and thereby limiting him. Our part in his new thing is to let him work in us a readiness to respond. You know, when God says that he's going to do a new thing, there's something very reassuring about the fact that it will be done right. Second, he doesn't tell us in order to free us from attempting to drum up faith. If God told us a new thing he was going to do, we'd try to stop him or try to help him. And all we'd be doing is getting, getting in the way. Third, God wants to uh, demonstrate his exhaustless resource of wisdom and power. You know, as a father of the lights to do things that uh, rejoice his children, or a husband would love to bring home a gift for his wife and demonstrates his love for her 
as a total and complete surprise. So God desires to show us something wonderful of himself that we haven't even figured out yet. It doesn't matter if we know uh, what the new thing is or not. Our hearts can be filled with hope, knowing that God is going to do it. And we know that when he does, it will be enough to handle the situation, no matter how impossible it seems to us. You know, there is never a time in human experience that God is not ready to invade the human dilemma with something of divine visitation of his newness that defies analysis until he does it. God does a new thing in order to produce new themes for our praise and to his glory. And Isaiah 43, 21 says, This people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. You know, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it hasn't started. Right now the Bible says it's going to spring forth. It isn't something in the future. You know, that was a puzzle to me until I went to the Hebrew text and was pleasantly uh, surprised to make a discovery. The Hebrew, Hebrew word spring here in verse 19 is a word for sprout. The problem I had was the word now suggests that if God's going to do a new thing, I'll be seeing it right now. However, what this text actually says is, now it shall sprout. Jesus, in speaking of the entry of his kingdom, said, first the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head in Mark 4.28. In other words, preliminary to even the visibility of a blade above the ground, there's a sprout beneath it. What the Lord wants us to understand when he says he's going to do a new thing is that it is a process already. You can't see it yet, but it's set in motion. Just like after a long, cold winter, there's a change going on inside the earth underground, preparing to bring the approach of spring uh, beyond what is... Uh, perhaps been the cold, bitter winter of your soul or the drought of a long, dry spell, the Lord says, he set in motion that which will bring about deliverance until the time of growth, development, refreshing, and fruitfulness. You know, when God's uh, new thing sprouts in you, it will be uh, with the fragrance and the beauty of springtime of his purpose in you. When the scriptures speak of that life springing forth, picture a slab of concrete that cannot resist the breaking power of the tiniest root of a blade of grass that pushes itself up through. God could not give us a more graphic picture than to say, your world is one in which I want to do a new thing. But I want you to recognize it's a new thing in you and a new thing for you. It is a novelty or sensation, but it's a richness of my working that will crack through any obstacles that would hinder the fulfillment of my glorious purpose in you. You know, there's something so sweet and tender, yet so mighty about God telling us he wants to do a new thing. I believe the Lord is uh, wanting us to hear him at a personal level. Hear the Lord say, be reminded of the kinds of things I can do and my exaltless resource of wisdom and power. Don't confine me to what I've already done or try to anticipate what I will do next. 
And though you may be captive, exiled, or guilty, my new thing is still for you. You know, I am your complete deliverer, making a way for you where there is no way. I come in my holiness to make you whole. My new thing will prepare you for whatever is to come. And out of it, you will find new things for your praise and to me. How can we open to God's new thing? We need to walk in simple obedience. Keep on loving Jesus. Praising the Lord every day. Feed on his word and manage our money God's way. You know, make a mental commitment to do the right thing and then say, Lord, work it in me. God's called you to his terms, not that he might manipulate you, but that he might bless you because all of his ways are righteousness and peace. The Lord is calling us to open to a new God thing because it's sprouting even now. He wants each of us to embrace it in our humanness, our personal life, our family, our relationships. He declared he will do it in his eternal word, and he's whispering it today by his powerful Holy Spirit. As he does, our response becomes pivotal. God may be doing a new thing, but it can blow right by us. Not because he's indifferent about our experiencing, knowing, and being transformed by it, but because it calls for our participation, and he will never force that on anyone. So join me in drawing nearer to the heart of God and inviting him to do a new thing in you today. Don't try to make it happen, but stand in expectancy because God's doing a new thing in the earth, and it's coming your way. That'll be the end of today's telecast. Until the next time, may God bless you.